So my understanding is you've got already gone through some basic EPUB um, training and seen kind of the inner workings of an EPUB 3. Um, <clears throat> my goal is just to do some a general overview of some accessibility concepts and how they relate to our workflow and how we're already accommodating them in our EPUB 3s that are generated from our digital hub. Um, and the end goal is really to reassure everyone that um, just by using our workflow, we're creating an accessible EPUB. So it's not meant to uh, become something where it feels like you have to do something extra in order to accomplish that. It's something that's just built into our workflow. Um, as you'll see as I kind of outline some of the concepts. So that's, if anything, <clears throat> to take away from this, what I'll be talking about is, is to be reassured that our entire workflow is based on kind of creating accessible materials. And at the moment, EPUB 3 is the accessibility um, uh, EPUB for, or ebook format of choice. Um, and I'll kind of outline some of uh, the concepts that are contained in that and how our workflow uh, generates those EPUBs. Um, anyway, so, <clears throat> excuse me, in a general sense, um, some of the main goals to take away from uh, accessibility in general is um, the end goal is really to create uh, a rich, informative publication that's available to the widest audience possible. Um, and we find that <clears throat> not only are we trying to accommodate people with, um, that may have a visual impairment or some other um, limitation, but really an accessible publication is more useful to all readers in general, we find. Um, and uh, another important aspect to take away um, as far as wanting to create accept more accessible publications is if you create <coughs> a single product from the start um, that's accessible to all, um, rather than based on need when you might get a request for something, um, you're not gonna have to repeat effort as often and um, you're gonna have a product that's more digestible to any reading audience um, without the need for scrambling or retroactively creating something after the fact based on a need. Um, and really what that brings us to is the industry standard um, ebook format at the moment is EPUB 3 um, that was developed <coughs> with accessibility in mind. Um, and I don't know if, if you've taken from as you were looking at EPUB 3, I don't know if Elvis explained, but it's essentially a mini website. Um, and the web is based on HTML5, uh, as, is, as are the uh, EPUBs that we produce. Um, and HTML5, as we'll see in a couple other points, um, it contains tags that, are, that have semantic meaning. Um, so it creates a very nice way to identify pieces of material based uh, on what they mean rather than what they look like, which as you've been introduced to before, is, goes hand in hand with Scribe's workflow. Um, that's one of the main tenets of what we're trying to do. Um, so <clears throat> one of the most important concepts for something to be accessible is simply to have a logical reading order um, and also the separation of presentation and content, which are two of the very basic components of our workflow and uh, you know, some of the more important concepts that we've been talking about for years. Um, the end game is to, you want an, a, <clears throat> a reading device or something that's reading aloud an ebook, for instance, or an assistive technology to be able to interpret what something is in a book without relying on the presentation. So if something's in a box visually, um, that's all well and good, but if the box is composed of regular paragraphs and then there's local formatting applied to make it look like a box, um, there's no way for, <clears throat> unless someone's visually looking at that, they, could not, they couldn't interpret what that's meant to be. Um, so <clears throat> for that reason, you know, we really harp on um, the most important thing is to structure the document, um, to use a logical reading order, um, to have a natural flow of the narrative and um, if you if you have call outs to images and tables to place them in a reasonable place you know after the reference in the text things like that so that <clears throat> so that logically just makes sense um, and then um, right so basically <clears throat> if we mark up everything properly based on what it is and not merely what it looks like then it allows 
any individual, including someone who's being read to by an assistive technology, to distinguish between things like sidebars, footnotes, and other text elements without relying on just visual, uh, visual presentation. So basically, just by definition, things that are composed in using the well-formed document workflow are more accessible by nature just because of how our workflow was developed, if that makes sense. Um, some other basic concepts. <clears throat> um, as far as the table of contents, it's important to have complete navigation. So, you know, we would encourage when a, uh, when a textbook's being created to, you know, try to include as many head levels as possible. Um, it's a good idea to include lists of illustrations and lists of tables, which is uh, how I'm abbreviating those here. Um, and <clears throat> as much linking as possible so that it's a fully navigable file and that um, it can be accessed in a few different ways and that all the content can be quickly um, linked to and from. Um, so when I mentioned like HTML5 and semantic tagging, um, so the newest version, the web is based on, and also as it happens, EPUB3, HTML5, it, does, it contains a series of semantic tags that have implied meaning rather than just generic terms like division or you know, just straight paragraphs, things like that. Um, it allows for a richer way of identifying on a more granular level pieces of information. Um, and our workflow, since, a, since EPUB 3 uses HTML5, our SCML uh, workflow when we, and when we go from SCML to an EPUB 3, for instance, um, with our processes map our tags to available HTML5 tags that have this semantic meaning. Um, for instance, um, what you would see in SCML as a chapter title or an A head in the resulting EPUB would become an H1 or an H2, which are sequentially, um, which are sequential hierarchical head levels that indicate structure. And it's more widely interpreted when these HTML5 tags are used, since those, since the web and um, the industry standard is basically is based on that. So what we do is we can create a document <coughs> that stores, since we have to interact with um, InDesign and Microsoft Word, um, what we do is we can store the most information and in the articulation of spacing distinctions for print and things like that in our file, and then our processes without any extra effort can map those distinctions to available HTML tags, um, which is a good point to mention. It's what, and a reason why we're not an HTML based workflow uh, is because we have more flexibility with the XML that we've developed in order to communicate with um, InDesign and Microsoft Word. Um, but since the web and EPUB is based on HTML5, uh, we do need to interact with it in that way. So we, can, we uh, develop processes that will map one to the other. Um, some other examples are, uh, we actually, there is some overlap. So we use a block quote division tag that maps directly to a block quote in HTML. Likewise with figure. Um, when we use sidebar and boxes, uh, those map to an HTML5 tag in our EPUBs that is an aside tag, uh, which indicates to any reading technology that it's not part of the main narrative. Um, some of those <coughs> read aloud softwares will allow you to toggle on and off and hide the sidebar material if it, if it you know, if someone finds it's distracting from, uh, from their learning. Um, uh, also things like, uh, so a box would also be, would also become a, an aside tag in HTML. Um, Things like lists that you would see in SCML where we have a, a, a wrapping, excuse me, a division level wrapper um, that indicates something, a list, it would ultimately become an HTML list so that um, there's nothing left to interpretation that, um, it, you know, that it can be interpreted as actual list. Um, we also have, <clears throat> I don't know if you guys, Elvis, have you touched on the um, accessibility styles uh, we didn't touch on those, now. Okay. Um, they haven't been widely adopted yet, um, but part of what we like to do, is we want to be prepared for whatever comes along. So in putting as much granular information and identifying as many pieces 
of information in our SCML workflow. Um, it can only benefit us in the future so that we're, you know, as more requests come and more um, requirements for accessible materials will be prepared. Um, this is not, so the use of these character styles is not imperative at the moment, um, but I'm just gonna outline a couple of uh, things. So basically, we created, HTML5 already has some uh, character level styles like cite, citation, EM for emphasis, those already existed and we, we've adapted them um, to be used uh, as our accessibility character styles as well. We also added a few that don't currently have a specific um, analog in HTML5, but F term is something that can be applied to a foreign word or technical term. Um, likewise with TNW, which is a title name or work. Um, the goal with these character styles is basically, it's a means for differentiating between what's merely just bold and italic visually versus what needs to be emphasized. Um, if, in other words, if a book is just filled with, <clears throat> if everything's italic when it's meant, you know, for a title of a work or, or emphasis or some sort of warning or written language, um, a, an assistive technology that's reading that wouldn't be able to interpret the difference between those things. So it could, it, so this allows us, if we choose, to apply these terms, or, or I'm sorry, to apply these tags early on in the process when a book is being developed in order to differentiate between regular bold and italic and what might be um, strong, which is used for emphasis, like a warning statement, or um, vocally stressed text versus just italic text that looks italic based on the design. Um, are there any questions about that or anything else so far? Like I said, these, these are available to us and these will be expanded as more HTML5 um, tags are available. Um, but this is a way of differentiating the most, what we consider some of the most important character level distinctions and be prepared for you know, however they need to be interpreted in the future. Um, so I already kind of talked about this. A reason why we're not an HTML5 based workflow is because we need to interact with some of these print technologies that <coughs> InDesign and uh, Microsoft Word, for instance, are XML based. Um, but we can harness some of the semantic meaning and tags of HTML5 as we go to EPUB, which is useful. Um, hey John, quick question. Yes. Um, uh, there's a there's a chat. I don't know if you have the the chat open, but um, Corinne has asked a question in the oh, chat. How do things like sidebars appear in an EPUB since it's reflowable text? Oh, um, I mean, how do they physically appear? Typically, we we like to leave them within the the main narrative. So, for instance, in this uh, this is just a sample file that Elvis had made. Um, the gray area is an example of just a typical sidebar. Um, if you were to look at this on an iPad, the styling would be a little more <coughs> elegant. It would have curved edges and such, but um, is the question just how they appear? Um, well, how they appear and also oh. kind of, sorry, I'll just talk. Um, okay, so thanks. How, how is it, because a lot of the times that content lives literally on the side of the page. So how is it decided where to pull it in? Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, that yeah, that's and how point. is a screen reader, just how, how does the screen reader right. read? Right, since, since obviously there's a limitation in a reflowable book, you can't, we're not going to place it on the side um, within the marginalia. So our typical convention is to put, if it's called out in the text, would be to place it without breaking a paragraph, generally closest to and directly after where it's first referenced. Um, we find that's, and that's, we're not the only people that do that. I mean, we find that's, that's a useful way to do it because um, it has to be within the main narrative of the, of the text. So what we try to do is just put it in a logical place where it won't distract. And if it's, if it's wound, winds up on another page where the reference is a page before, um, in our SAM stage, when we, after we've exported a file, um, we'll do some basic checks for that and make sure that things appear uh, where it makes sense, and in some cases, we will move them. 
if that makes sense. Um, yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay, and uh, you know we can always we can always talk more about that if if, if you need to some other time. Um, so anyway, so just to go briefly through a couple other things that are just inherent in um, EPUB in general and in our EPUBs. There's things like page lists, um, which you may or may not have seen. Um, when we export um, files that are typeset using our system and go through our scribe tools, um, you know, if we have the fonts loaded and there's no reflow, we'll get, we will get page IDs placed um, at the location of the original print page. Um, that's very useful because <clears throat> um, EPUB 3 allows for something called a page list which is basically just an HTML list representing all of the original print page numbers. And each of these um, links is just a hyperlink to a spot in a particular file where that page ID will live. So even though the text is reflowable, uh, one has a means to actually navigate to the original print page number. So if someone was sitting, if, if an instructor is reading from a print page book and says turn to page 200, um, most, if not all, of the of you know, uh, if you're reading a book on Adobe Digital Editions, you, there's a pane you can open where you can navigate right to a page number. Um, it also allows us to easily link uh, page number-based ind indices. Um, so, and it is part of the accessibility standard outline for EPUB three. So it's good to take advantage of that. Um, it doesn't require extra work as long as uh, you know when you go to export all your fonts are loaded and there's been no reflow, you'll get uh, an analogous print page number in an ID. So that's something to take advantage of. Um, then it comes to the alt text. So um, my understanding is alt text, well, first of all, alt text is uh, an alternate description of an image if, you know, if the image is either, were either not to be displayed or if someone's not able to perceive it. Um, it's typically limited to about 150 to 200 characters. Um, there is something called a long description, which we don't yet accommodate in the digital hub, but it's, uh, it's something we're developing. Um, basically, a good rule of thumb is, you, you, or even initially when you're acquiring the images and when you're creating a textbook, um, you wanna steer away from using images that Basically, if, if the image were to disappear, would the surrounding text have any description of it or would it make sense at that point? So you would, a general rule of thumb is to avoid using images that are dense um, with text. Um, and certainly if that were to be done, then you would wanna consider um, also supplying some alternate text that would describe adequately, adequately describe that image if it were not um, viewable. Um, the nice thing is, um, we very recently, and it will be rolled out soon, our digital hub, this is only in testing right now, but we have a way of round tripping alternate text all the way from the inception of a, of a manuscript. You can add it in the docx um, and it will be carried throughout the process, um, which is nice because if you, you'll be able to see it and you know, if, uh, as copy editing commences and things like that, it doesn't have to be something that's added after the fact. Um, like I said, that's currently on, just on our development testing hub side, um, but uh, that's been working really well, and that will be something that will be available in the future. Um, there are, there's also something called, and this is also something we're now accommodating in our testing hub um, that'll be rolled out. There's some, <clears throat> there are new elements of accessibility metadata, which are basically means of identifying um, what assistive technologies or what what additional features might be included in your particular ebook that's those will be fields in the digital hub where you'll have a chooser menu and you can say like you know if i've added all alternative text you're going to identify it as such so that you're credited with that and then be, make sure material is more discoverable for people who might be looking for those or you know for looking for alternative text or any um, enhancements like that um, for the most part it's not you know they will default you know, there's, they get very specific, you know, an accessibility hazard. That more applies to um, things like apps and uh, 
and EPUBs that may have, well, it, it could apply to EPUBs that have video embedded and things like that. It will just default to none at the moment, but, um, you know, mo uh, one option is captions, you know, obviously most books will have captions, so that would be something you would toggle on. Um, and then there's also required uh, in order to meet general accessibility standards is a summary, which would be just actually general language that you would uh, enter in order to describe whether you're trying to meet or have met a particular requirement that might be uh, that might come into play. Um, as far uh, another good way to keep something accessible is to clearly denote what language it's in. Um, the digital hub will just default to English, but you have you'll have a you do have a chooser menu to identify um, basically any language available. Um, and then just a few other additional considerations. Um, one thing I like to we like to stress is <clears throat> in order to make something accessible, it's good to think about it, you know, at the very early stages of the project. Um, it would just it, it'll create less headache down the road. But some general things that I found are useful are to always consider using explicit references to things like figures and tables and boxes rather than say like, you know, as I said in the last uh, box, things like that. It's a good idea to, you know, if they're numbered in sequence, box one, one, things like that, just leaves less up to interpretation. Um, related to that is also, you know, in image spreads um, or elsewhere, try to avoid directional language that someone wouldn't be able to interpret um, unless they were visually observing a book. Um, I already kind of touched on images with dense text. Um, you know, if an image goes away, can the surrounding, will the surrounding text adequately describe what, what was there? Um, things like that are good to consider. Um, you know, and try to avoid things like referencing colors or making it so the only way to interpret um, material is based on referencing particular colors in the text. So it's a good idea to think about that kind of stuff early on. Um, another thing is um, <clears throat> tables are problematic in ebooks, um, especially when they go beyond a few columns, maybe like four columns or so. Um, and I know tables, people like tables and they're, you know, they're often, they can be required, but it's a good idea to think about if that material can be presented in another way. Um, so if it's merely a list of things and it's 12 columns wide, but doesn't need to be a table, um, it's often a good idea to consider early on um, reworking those types of things as lists. It'll just be easier for read-along technologies to, um, to uh, read them to the, to the user and also from a practical standpoint, having large tables just on a, an iPad, even for someone who, who um, doesn't need any assistive technology, they can often get cut off and they're very clunky. And we just like to um, advise people not to use tables unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, and then kind of just wrapping it up. I mean, so as far as, a lot of this is based on best practices and just sort of a lot of what this is to get things future proof for when the um, guidelines and requirements for accessibility may become more stringent. Um, but basically, everything I've outlined above um, is based on some general web accessibility guidelines, which um, go hand in hand with the EPUB 3 open standard. So the organization that created EPUB 3, the IDPF, um, they developed the EPUB 3 format with accessibility in mind and in conjunction with the web accessibility guidelines. Um, so all these things like the HTML semantic tags and page lists and alternate text, that all comes from, from those regulations. Um, we also recently discovered, which we're, going, <coughs> we're considering incorporating into our digital hub, um, the DAISY Consortium has created an actual validator that will assess how accessible your EPUB is. Um, the good news is, with the exception of, well, our, ours passed with flying colors, 
It doesn't actually flag at the moment whether you have alternate text or not, because it's not strictly required for every book and every organization. Um, so that is that would fall under a best practice and something to keep in mind for the future. Um, but once we roll out the accessibility, uh, additional accessibility metadata fields, um, uh, our EPUBs have a very good report from that checker. And the nice thing, and I want to reiterate is, it doesn't require any real extra thought or extra intervention um, just by using the workflow um, and all the concepts inherent in it and structuring content well and thinking about making things explicit explicitly referenced and all those things, um, you really get, at the moment, um, without any extra work, you get a very accessible EPUB that can be digested and interpreted by all, is our hope. Um, that's kind of what I wanted to say about it. I don't know if people have questions or any specific concerns about EPUB in general or accessibility, anything.